Now it's time for our panel of experts. Mia Shah Dand is the CEO of Lighthouse 3, where she advises global organizations on responsible innovation with new and emerging technologies like AI. She's also the founder of a great organization, Women in AI Ethics, and creator of the 100 Brilliant Women in AI Ethics list. Uh, I love it, and I think we're all going to talk a bit about it in a moment. And Paul Doherty is the group chief executive and chief technology officer at Accenture. Get on his Twitter uh, feed. It's, it's just mind-blowing, some of the things they're doing. He's also co-author of Human and Machine, a Management Playbook for Success in the New Age of AI. And Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, right here in town, a senior fellow and director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. Uh, she researches policy designed to enable equitable access to technology across the United States and to harness its power to create meaningful change. Uh, I really appreciate all of you joining me today. Um, and Mia, I am a, a big fan of your list because, you know, I, like anybody, you know, I, I raise this question of, you know, technology, you know, both promise and peril. How do you get these things right? Because it's so transformative. And this is where you can get the sense of the transformative nature of a lot of this, uh, looking at Paul Doherty's, you know, feed, which I enjoyed, you know, going through today. And I retweeted a lot of his stuff. But Mia, you know, when you when it comes to these equities, you know, part of the question I, I talked about before is I once sat in at a dinner in uh, Silicon Valley where the topic was, do we have the technology and the aspiration to end death, you know, eventually? And, and some Washington types said, well, this is going to cause some real problems uh, for the entitlements in, you know, sector, you know, Social Security and, you know, ongoing care. And it showed a difference between, you know, innovation and, you know, essentially how do we regulate it and get it right? I'm interested as we talk about AI, and I, and I, and I, and I try to be careful of talking about AI just blandly. It is so potentially transformative of everything. What are the big equities that you think we need to get right? What are you trying to embed in this course um, that we're on? Great. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Steve, for having me here. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy in these challenging times. Uh, so the, the, the thinking behind the 100 women, list, women in AI ethics list was looking at the inequities in the tech industry. So we've been talking about how inequality is an issue, how inequity is an issue, and we don't see enough representation from women, and especially from marginalized communities in tech. And yet over the decades, the numbers haven't changed much. We are still in single digit when, digits when it comes to representation of women of color, uh, people of color in the tech industry. It's still in single digits. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing which is not working? And one of the key issues is we don't have the right people at the table. Hmm. So we make a big show of inviting, um, doing these DEI initiatives, and they make the headlines, and we have these big goals and aspirations. But when folks actually walk through the door, one is, are they getting the response, and are they getting uh, an environment that's welcoming to them? As we all have seen, the tech industry can be an unfriendly place for minorities. It's like, how are we going to change not just the numbers, not just the count, and making, but making sure that the women's voices and the marginalized communities' voices are counted because that inequity shows up in artificial intelligence. In the, uh, for example, facial, facial recognition technology does not recognize mm. uh, people of color as well as this does uh, light skin or white skin folks. Uh, and that inequity is showing up in all of the technologies which are being developed. So that's what we want to address right at the core. And, 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 and real quick, you know, are you fine, before I jump to Nicole, are, are you finding some industry, because I've talked to Google about this, I've talked to Facebook about this, and, and at least the people I've talked to recognize this as an issue and challenge. And, you know, I've met, you know, their engineers and, you know, sort of, talk. are you finding, so here, the two part question, are you finding them receptive to working with, which I sense there are, but then it raises the question as we talk about the international mentions, you know, when you're over in China or when you're over in other countries around the world, do they have that same receptivity to some of the agenda you're raising? Again, great question. And uh, company, uh, funny that you mentioned Google. It, this is an uh, open secret. A lot of companies know about it. It's no longer, it, this is 2021. If anyone tells you, I don't think there's an issue of inequity in tech, they're lying or they're in denial. So uh, with Google especially, they just fired one of the top leading uh, AI ethics uh, researcher, hmm. and uh, Dr. Timnit Gebru, who has contributed a lot to the space. She's very well known, very well respected. So the question is, if you know about it, what are you going to do about it? And do your actions line up hmm. with your words? And that's essentially what we want to see. see. And uh, we keep, um, we use China as an example. And we say we are falling behind and what's happening in China. 
in terms of our investments, in terms of our um, leading the way in AI, we're already there. The investments mm. that we are making, um, and I feel like that's going to make us more competitive, including the marginalized voices, bringing all of uh, Americans together to work this initiative, is going to make us only stronger and more right. competitive right. versus other countries. I feel that's the framing that we should be looking at. You know, Nicole, um, you know, we, you know, I want to jump to Paul in a second, bring him in. You know, he's a technologist and understands this field real well. I've always thought, and you and I have you know, spoken about this before, that, you know, technology in a way, and I thought this innocently and naively, gives us an opportunity, if you package it right, to leapfrog out of some of the uh, ridiculous biases that we have, the discrimination, the inequality. You know, I'll never forget talking to the former, uh, you know, a former mayor, his former Department of, you know, Secretary of Transportation about how our freeway bypasses essentially discriminated against, you know, black community around the country and that we built in an embedded discriminatory infrastructure that that harmed communities. Right. So, you know, as we begin thinking about these, you can undo it. And I'm interested in technology seemed to me to have promise to leapfrog out of that. So let me ask you. Are we achieving that? How's it going? Are we, on a scale of one, zero to ten, where are we in in leapfrogging you know, out of some of these? You know, it's interesting, Stephen. Thanks for having me, and uh, glad to be here talking about this topic. I mean, first and foremost, I think to your point, we thought that technology is going to be the lowest barrier to entry particularly for historically disadvantaged groups. That's not the case, right? Um, shameless plug, I'm working on a book on this. It comes out this year on the U.S. digital divide. And it's really about how the digital access is really creating the next underclass. And it's not just people of color, it's farmers. There are women that are part of this, people who are older, people who live in geographic areas where there's just no competition. At the end of the day, to your point and what Mia's talking about, we're basically at the stage where the systemic inequalities that have historically defined who we are in this country and around the world are actually seeping into technology. And part of the reason that it does that is because these models are being created by people who carry their own values, assumptions, and unconscious and explicit biases into the development of those models. And so to your point, where we thought that technology was going to be the lowest barrier for entry, what it's actually done is create and persist these systemic inequalities that find themselves entangled in racial inequalities and gender biases, et cetera. I mean, it's no secret that what we're experiencing in algorithmic bias right now, the work that I do at Brookings, is that it is very much tied to the types of outcomes and the types of barriers that we actually see in society and criminal justice algorithms who make decisions on whether judges should uh, detain or release uh, defendants. Guess what? They're using data that is already over criminalizing black people, already placing more faces of color into facial recognition databases. And those have impacts, you know, mm -hmm. and those impacts in the end of the day, unless they have some framework that basically brings what I call permissionless uh, innovation and permissionless forgiveness into a state of compliance around civil and human rights. We're actually going to continue to have this conversation and much worse the more data we collect about individuals, the more we will know how to profile them online. And so I think, Steve, to your point, I, I was there with you for a long time. I've been doing this for 25 years. But my book is now suggesting that there's some pernicious activities that actually happen, unintended, intended. But at the end of the day, we need to actually see technology not by itself as this wild, wild west, but really falling within the context of the society in which we live. Look, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I mean, I'm with you in the sense that I know that what we need to do is surface these issues and talk about them and see what we can do. Paul is one of these people who's done things. I mean, Paul's got this. So I don't want to you know, go down Paul's story too much. But one of the things I really like, Paul, is the voice, the non-binary, non-gender specific voice that you developed, I think called Sam. And uh, I went to listen to it today. I was very uh, impressed. But you know, part of what we're saying, not that it, it, it necessarily is the driver in how we think of all things technology, but what I found in your feed today was the power of innovation swimming along with the, the power of purpose. And it's, I maybe, and I don't mean to like do advertising for you because maybe I'm getting it wrong. So tell me where I'm wrong. Am I wrong? Are you not about innovation and purpose? <laughs> it's, uh, it's perfect. I think I want to quote you on that, Steve. The power of innovation <laughs> swimming with the uh, the power of purpose. Yeah, no, the way I look at this, and I, I love being on this with uh, with me and Nicole uh, in this dis discussion because I couldn't agree with them more. You know, the way I, if you step back from this, we're 70 years into an information technology revolution. 70 years ago, the transistor was patented not too far away from where I'm 
sitting here in New Jersey, and that started this all. And what the reality is, 70, 70 years, seven decades into this, we're at a point where it's not just technology that we use. The technology is fundamentally changing us as people. It's changing our lives. Think of what happened when COVID hit. Billions of people instantaneously changed their behavior and started interacting with each other differently. It accelerated you know, the digital solutions and our digital interaction, uh, you know, by years, you know, in terms of the advances hmm. that we've had. And um, and I think, so I think the power of technology is, is phenomenal. I, I talk about two truths. One truth is that every business and every organization in the public sector is becoming a technology business. That's what it means to be digital. You're built on technology. The second truth is that exponential increases and in acceleration in technology potential will continue for the next couple of of decades. You put those two together, and I think it adds up to what Mia and Nicole are talking about, where just because you can do something with technology doesn't mean you should. And the, it's, the obligation is on us as a society, us as businesses, us as governments, to understand the proper use. And that's what we talk about as responsible and purposeful innovation. We talk about specific principles, fairness, uh, transparency, accountability, human centricity, honesty that we need to incorporate in you know the solutions that we build, that's very much the way we think about it at Accenture. Well, let me just ask you, just all three of you, real quick. You know, one of the interesting points of discussion which has come up, you know, which you've mentioned, is facial recognition software. And you know, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, wrote a fascinating book called Tools and Weapons. And in this book, he said, "Look, there are a lot of technologies emerging that have profound possibility for transforming society in really, really good ways." And and, you know, helping us, you know, collectively to achieve ends, but they can also be dangerous. They can also, you know, create incredible uh, rabbit holes that end up being very destructive for society. And he talked about Microsoft's decision not to aid and assist China in the deployment of facial recognition software in its social capital system. But you look back this past week, we're using facial recognition software to identify seditionists, and I will call them that, who attacked the United States Capitol, um, potentially threatening the lives of, of, of not only just uh, congressmen, legislatures, and others, but you know, uh, you know, killing uh, Capitol policemen and others. So I, I guess my question in, in this case is, here we have a, a, a technology. How do we begin to use that technology? In my view, we used it constructively this week to go after very bad people. Um, but how do you prevent it from becoming something where good people become victims of that? Um, Mia? Sure. There are um, a lot of these act. There are many activists like Tawana Petty and others who have come out against usage of facial recognition technology mm -hmm. because, Steve, we are looking at a slippery slope here. If we start using these technologies with this, even with the good intent, we also have to be cognizant they can always be used for other not insidious purposes because I'll counter that with facial recognition technology has made mistakes. It's being used to, uh, to make life or death decisions. Um, There's a gentleman who was, again, falsely arrested because of a flawed, um, because of a flaw in the recognition technology hmm. that misidentified him. So as we go forward, as we deploy these technologies, I don't think it's good enough to say, yes, it can be used for good. Hmm. But if um, it can be used for if the downside outweighs the benefits, then we have mm. to strongly look at are these technologies, should it, they even be deployed? So maybe thinking about uh, these technologies um, in a uh, just doing the counterbalance of what are the harms they cost versus the benefits right. might be a good way to look at how do we utilize these technologies to the best extent that we can. Terrific. Um, Nicole, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with Bia to the point that we have to always counterbalance these technologies. I mean, part of the challenge with immediate bans is that we don't know where the application of technology could actually be done for public good. Uh, you're completely correct that what the technology is doing to sort of scan the faces, and we're not, we're working on something right now, Brookings on this, and we actually have a facial recognition project. You know, it's not clear the extent to which facial rec recognition technology is being actively used. But one thing, as Mia sort of insinuated, is uh, a month ago, a black man in Detroit sat in the police department for six hours because he was misidentified. And so I think mm. what we're learning in these technologies, it's not about whether or not it's good enough. It's about the technical cadence. 
I know as an African-American woman, facial recognition doesn't do a great job on darker skin hues and black women who change their hair. Mm. I just wanted to see me, Steve. That's it, right? <laughs> so I think we need to have those conversations on technical cadence. And I think it's also important for us to understand the context, the use cases that are more problematic. It is more problematic when we give law enforcement these shiny objects, but yet they're not trained on it or they don't understand the human and civil rights implications or they're used for the good of capturing, you know, insurrectionists, but they're not very well, you know, in identifying people in the Congressional Black Caucus who have been misidentified oftentimes for mugshots of criminals. So I think we need to go back, as Mia said, and really have these conversations. And I think these conversations need to be interdisciplinary. I'm a sociologist. I'm an AI. Part of it is people don't hear us. And I think it goes back to a comment Mia made earlier. More people need to be at the table or making decisions around the extent to which we want to rely upon the predictiveness of emerging technologies. Real quick, Nicole, you know, I um, recently had on the president of Brookings, John, General John Allen, who you know, recently wrote a book on AI and said, look, this is an area we can't uh, fall behind in, and, and we are falling behind in. You know, so so I, I think he wrote less about some of the concerns you are, but is there a nexus where your concerns and his concerns can meet and be happy? <laughs> well, I work for him, so I'm never gonna say that I'm not happy. I'll <laughs> just be clear about that. Well, you know, I think General Allen is actually right on point. I mean, his concern from the national security side is the extent to which AI can be weaponized against populations. Right. And that's something across the world that we don't want. I mean, China is clearly in a race to win AI, and if they get their hands not just on the, uh, the dollars to create new models and the patents and the intellectual property, we're sort of doomed in the United States because we're not ahead in that space. And, I, and I've written about that extensively in terms of the U.S. competition with China. But I do think it's important what uh, John is talking about and what Daryl West also co-authored with him is that we have to come to some synergies around a framework for the use of these technologies. These technologies have the potential. And, and I, I'll just say this really quickly and just really briefly. The people who are designing those technologies are not inclusive or representative of the people that they are being applied upon. So I would take Paul's earlier reference. It's not just about responsible AI anymore. It's about inclusive AI. It's about you know resilient AI that can actually be adaptable in a variety of situations. It's about evaluative AI that we can actually go back and say, this didn't really quite work well on black people or Latina people or you know the context in which it was actually placed was not appropriate. So I think, Steve, until we get to that point, we can have that conversation across the globe and right. particularly the United States. I honestly think there's some opportunity with the new right. administration to take this on, in all honesty, because racial equity is part of their, their sweet spot. So I think, again, we've got to have conversations on what this looks like in the future. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to give you the last word. And, you know, as you as you reflect on what I just shared, you know, what we just saw this last week in, in Washington and, and, and technologies that can be helpful but also be abused. But, but I guess my question is, also to ask you, what would you most like to see from policy land here in Washington, D.C.? You know, you're an industry. What do you most need from the policy world to keep the ecosystem of innovation smart, edgy, doing good things? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd highlight a few things real, uh, real quickly. One is uh, a, a national R&D strategy around the technologies that are key to our competitiveness that aligns our federal investments and in, in resources with the public sector so we have a real national strategy on the things that matter, AI, cloud computing, quantum computing, et cetera. I think that's critical. The second is real data policy. We need federal level data legislation, data, data privacy legislation. We as a company have uh, called for that uh, on our own as part of, and as part of the business roundtable. I think that's critical and we need to make some advances in that area because that's at the heart of some of the issues that we're talking about. And the third area that I really highlight that I think is critical is education and skilling. I think some of the, the issues we have in the country, some of the underlying issues we have are because of lack of access, lack of education, lack of skills for relevant jobs. And as we look at AI and other technologies that impact the equation, we need to be putting, we need to be going all in on the skills of all of our, all of our people, you know, to be participating in relevant ways in the new digital and technology enabled economy that we're moving mm -hmm. into. Well, thank you. I want to thank all of you. Paul Doherty, Group Chief Executive of Technology and CTO of Accenture. Mia Dan, CEO of Lighthouse 3 and founder of Women in AI Ethics. And Nicole Turner-Lee, Senior Fellow of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at Brookings Institution. Really appreciate it. I, you know, I, I, um, 
I'll make a deal with you. Let's, let's give this a few months. Let's kind of come back and talk about what we're getting right, what we're getting wrong in the new administration, because I'm sure we're going to stick with this topic for a while. Thank you so much for joining us. Next time, I promise to add on 15 more minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Thank all. You.